Welcome to an hour of power. I am Keith Anthony Blanchard, spiritual teacher, musician, author of the best-selling book, Homecoming, Crossing the Bridge to the Soul, and your host of Center of Light. Let's dive in. <clears throat> Welcome to Center of Light. Keith Anthony Blanchard here. Top of the Merlin to you, Mr. McCracken. Good to see you here at Center of Light. It's always my aim to be clear. This is the time of clarity. My guest today, Mr. Fred Matzer, 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 is going to tell us about his clear experience he had some years ago. We're speaking to this beautiful gentleman about his new book, Beyond Us, and I think his documentary movie called Beyond Me. I watched it yesterday, and it was beyond me. <laughs> it reminds me a lot of the experiences I had many years ago when this all began to unravel. I would like to first say to my audience, good morning, everyone. Um, I need a couple of sounding boards. I've been ha like now. Um, we just recently had an ice storm, as you know, and it boogered some of the lines in the ground. If you feel at any moment in this presentation that... The message of my guest is not being delivered due to the pixelation and the freezing of this feed. Just say, Keith, just reschedule. Uh, I, I can really use your support because if we can't hear uh, the story behind this uh, powerful interview, what would be the point to continue? So please uh, be my sounding board. Let me check YouTube, see what's happening there. <clears throat> Dana says, yes, it's freezing on YouTube. Soma is there. Um, if you guys want to continue to Facebook, we'll play this out for a few minutes, see how it goes. They are coming to fix my technology Friday morning. They got to do some work in the ground. So let me tell you about my guest, see what happens. If not, we're going to get him back, that's for sure. Today, my guest is Mr. Fred Matson. We're speaking about his new book, Beyond Us. I did drop a link in the forum, <clears throat> excuse me, to his website. Please go stomp all over his page and leave a big noise there. Let them know you exist. Um, I don't have his bio in front of me. Shame on me. So much has happened. Let's just get him on Center of Light Radio and he can tell us exactly who he is and why he does what he does in a beautiful way. Fred, welcome to Center of Light Radio, my friend. Thank you so much, Keith. Wonderful to see you, meet you, hear <coughs> you. And let's uh, start. We had a time getting together, didn't we? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Tell us a little about yourself, Fred, how you got into all this, how this movement, the foundation, give us a little background on you, sir, if you would, please. Yeah, way back, age 19, to my surprise, my dad, who was the first real estate developer in the Netherlands, who, alas, had Parkinson and diabetes, asked me to join and become his successor in the real estate business. Completely a surprise to me, he said, I can't wait for your younger brother as uh, my health and my speaking abilities are deteriorating fast. To make a long story short, I went into his footsteps, became board member being 23, 26. I was CEO of a company with nearly 200 people. Dad died in 77. I married, got three wonderful children got divorced, um, uh, dad left us a substantial inheritance. And so it was that in 1983, I discontinued working in the company. Um, I went to Red Cross, Red Crescent in Geneva. At that stage, 144 member states or member organization. And I had a talk with the secretary general of Red Cross and I said, I'm here to volunteer. And he said, well, that's good because I'm just about to start a big program. Do you know, this is back in 1983, that five million under five children die related to the dehydration that goes with diarrhea? I was shocked. He said, it is amazing. It's the biggest cause of death in the world at this moment. And the miracle is uh, that we can fight it. We can combat this illness because there's a very effective intervention called oral rehydration salts. So in 
So I said, it's effective, he said, it's super cheap. At the time, uh, $25 cents was the cost of one sachet. You would need three sachet, sachets of oral rehydration salts, a combination of salt, water, and sugar that you can administer and give to the child. And in 90% of the cases, the child will recuperate. So I was blown away. How is it possible that in this world, this super effective cheap medicine of which the ing ingredients can be found in abundance in nature that we're not taking care of it, that we're not paying attention to it. The answer being it's too cheap to make a pro to, to make a profit on it. And it happens from a Western point of view over there. Who cares? And so that really opened my eyes. By the way, I accepted the invitation that he gave to me to become the leader of the program. And I started back in 83 to do this work for three years, and uh, which brought me all over the world, learned many more lessons. This lesson, of course, that I just shared with you was, was huge. And the beauty of it, Keith, is what does salt, sugar, and water do is also to think about how often we think in symptom curing of symptoms. No, with salt and sugar, what happens is when a, when a child or whoever gets diarrhea, the electrolytes, which are the components to keep the, the immune, immune system running, they leave the body. But by combining sugar and water, the intestinal walls will be opened to facilitate the electrolyte, the salts, to get into the system, in the bloodstream. And so it is that the uh, immune system can be reset. So it is beautiful. You don't need medicine. You just, just know, need a natural support in a natural body. So that was a big lesson. Lesson two was that at Red Cross at headquarters, there were two, 300 people from 60, 70 countries, all winter wanting, uh, wanting to help. I was one of them. But I felt like I looked around me that many of my colleagues were under stress. They so much needed to help. And then I came to a deep realization that if I want to help other people, that I first need to help myself. Otherwise, I export my own stress into already vulnerable areas. And I've been involved in many international projects since, what is it, 40 years now nearly, and I see people making the mistake all, all over again. We go full of stress to other countries. We hardly have patience. We want to bring knowledge, but don't have the patience to sit with the people so often all those efforts, how well meant they are, often fall apart. If you do not have the patience, respect for the other and yourself to create a bridge, a bridge to cross fertilize each other, but you only are your own misunderstanding by thinking that you need to bring something and that you don't can receive anything and learn from the other, you better not go. So that were the lessons at Red Cross. But now um, in Geneva, in Switzerland, the very important event to which you referred at another occasion um, happened. Uh, what was the situation? A friend of mine had an illness, I don't know what, but he was helped by an American healer from New York. And he said, Fred, I know that in your family, diabetes runs, and it might be interesting to go through the procedure with this man. And so it was that uh, a few days later, I found myself in the apartment of my friend in the Swiss Alps, and I met the healer, a healer with a friend. This is by, way back in 85, 1985. And he said, please sit down, I'll cook for you, I'll, uh, cook for you brown rice, 
at the uh, big portion of uh, uh, healthy uh, half cooked vegetables. You drink two liters of water, and I give you a meniscus portion of condensed nutmeg. And he said this invention of this condensed nutmeg was done done by Dr. Jonas Salk, the father of the polio vaccine. And he said, to assure you, I treat him myself with this stuff. Um, so I got the combo. I felt good. He put me in a hot bath. And after 10 minutes, hot bath put me on the floor. And I got a profound massage. In the meantime, I heard from the loudspeakers in the room, um, we are the world, uh, sung by Stevie Wonder. It was amazing. And never before I was <clears throat> so <coughs> aware of the text. And it came so deep into me that I felt better and better and better. I would say I got a clarity. Everything around me left me. Tensions in the body were not anymore there. And at a certain stage, I said, Sally, a friend of ours, who was skiing there, she's breaking her collarbone, her right collarbone, and she will be here within 10, 15 minutes, and she will ask for a taxi to go to the hospital. And within 10, 15 minutes, she was there. And she asked, blah, 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 for what I saw. From then on, Keith, I became very interested in how is it possible that my consciousness is connected to an event that is not in the range of either of my uh, senses and I'm still aware how do I know so that question troubles me since and of course I can talk many hours about what the findings are in, until so far but <clears throat> most importantly I realized at that moment that until that moment I lived a sequential life and something with the combo that I was given helped me to deconnect from the lateral way of living and brought me in a transcendent state, in a state where, and I've had, had several, had several ex, uh, experiences afterwards too, that brought me beyond me in, in a field where there is no beginning nor an end. And perhaps it illustrates better what happened a few months after. I was in the kitchen at home. I had the same combo given. And on the clock in front of me, it was three hours and 10 minutes in the afternoon. And I had a watch as well, not only because could I see on the watch at the same time, but it had a second and indicator too. So it showed three hours, 10 minutes, and 10 seconds. <clears throat> now imagine the following, and now I need a little support because I need to bring you into an area that I can a little bit uh, describe in concrete terms and a little bit in different terms. Now imagine I'm in that state, I feel very good. I'm not feeling that enormously well as I had experienced before. And I close my eyes and I see a parallel in the closing of the eyes as the moment that I go through the curtains or the veil, the curtains in the kitchen. And as I walk through the kitchen curtain, I find myself on the other side of the curtain. And when I look around me, I can't see a curtain. I can't see anything. I just feel pure bliss. It's like a eternal orgasm, 
but not sexually. I it understand is, that. I really understand it, yeah, those words. Yeah. So it is, it goes through your body, it transpires your body in a way, and it goes through the space around it. And the skin is not the border as we know the skin to be. In the meantime, the me implodes. There is no me. There's here, isn't it? There's nothing. Ness. Nothingness. So I want you all to think about it that in that state of mind or being or level of awareness, there is no beginning, there is no end. So I realized afterwards that beginning and ends are qualities that are parallel or that are qualities of the finite time and space, the, trend, the world, the lateral world that we are more or less collectively as humans experiencing. So back to that moment or of that experience, so it lasted eternal. And I mean, so longer than zillions of years, although I experienced at that time, what is it, 50 years or 45, 40 years. And then at a certain moment I thought, why me? And all of a sudden it was over. So in that moment and you instated, in, 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 in that I moment you instated, in that moment you instated the you of it all, or at least what we think we are. And that's what stopped the experience, yes? Yes, because I, what I did by triggering in my mind, why, that's a question, that's a, an idea concept of the lateral, and me is a concept also of the lateral world. It's not a concept in eternity, in the infinite. So that triggered <laughs> back into the line. And so I watched, looked at the clock in front of me, it was back three hours and 10 minutes, and I'm on my watch three hours, 10 minutes, and... 10 or 12 seconds later, you know? So <laughs> it's interesting. So you have the perspective of the lateral perspective, which I did not have. So I missed in lateral experience 12 seconds because I was without me in being me in being nothing, being beingless or isness or whatever. Fred, I would like to, to insert something here, which remind me of an experience I had many years ago. <clears throat> One moment. Many years ago, coming out of a night's sleep. Yes, do the same. Coming out of a night's sleep, I find myself in that <clears throat> spiritual lobby, that place where you feel the pull that you're about to wake up to start your day. And in this place, <clears throat> I had no thought. It, I was just peaceful. And I stayed there, and I stayed there. I had no thought. And, and in this place, I finally decided, oh my gosh, I am so peaceful. Took me out just like that. As long as I was in it, I declared this state of being when I said, this place is so, so peaceful. So I engaged what I thought was happening or an idea, and it completely took me out. This reminds me so much of that experience. The levels of bliss that you're referring to, uh, I, those, I long for them. This is actually what drives me in my work is to not only be a teacher for others, but to be a student by others that I may return to that garden, if you will. Is that what drives you is just being with that? I mean, do you still carry this space with you that you can shift to at will? I cannot. I've never been able to shift to it uh, at will. Nutmeg has helped me, but also long periods of meditation can bring you there as well. So it is uh, both possible, but I have not the power to invoke it or command it. I need to be, I can create the circumstances by feeling peaceful to help and lower my brain frequency. As you know, the highest possibility to be informed, to connect to what I would call divine information. That information is that what informs us that access and expresses itself in all kinds of forms is at the lowest rate frequency. So 
the optimum being part of um, the whole is uh, basically in the non-life, I think, which people describe it as death, and me too. Let's talk about your book, sir. How can Beyond Us, your new release, <laughs> help those who are struggling with the chaos of this world? Because there's a lot of noise happening out there. <clears throat> How does Beyond Us support the betterment and the expansion into a more powerful, empowered idea that one can be, begin to find themselves in a state of absolute balance when everything is just so moving in the, the chaotic, yeah. noisy world? Well, first of all, I'm part of that chaos often myself. So, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So often I have to, I struggle with it. And I, many times I create these islands of silence by taking walks in the, in the wood or on the street, listening to classical music and meditating. Um, yeah, the book basically is there. It's a group of essays that are brought together to give people of several subjects different perspectives. And it depends on which part you pick. Uh, but I, I've heard it, it's quite inspiring because uh, it describes from observations not to travel all the time the beaten path. So there are at any moment in time, much more options than we are taught that there are options. So in that sense, if you find the time, the book is not that they come in pages under 30, you find, find a lot of inspiration to, um, to go and make different decisions in life, to be more free. So it helps you to unshackle. What is it you hope that people will take in the form of a course of action after reading your book, Beyond Us? Uh, be more forgiving. <laughs> yeah, right. Be more patient with yourself. And to go from an attitude of competing to an attitude of cooperation and comparing in order to share with care. And there are many arguments to go that way, why the world is a coexisting system. Every particle with which we would describe the world or, or the universe, if it's deep down in the earth under high pressure or in the most subtle fields of, at the edges of our universe, Every particle being an atom, a molecule, a cell or whatever coexists with the other. So a person or an element can never be on the same spot at the same time as another person or another spot. So if we really become deeply aware of it, we cannot compete. The, our sheer presence is an expression of love, an expression of creation that is doing a dance in coexistence, an ever transforming um, kaleidoscope of events that we can connect, uh, that we can connect with through our senses. So if we allow that awareness to sink in deeply, and we keep on doing that, we can help to reprogram our brains. And if we meet circumstances, and we do every, every minute different, every second different circumstances, with that attitude, that will change our decision-making patterns. What about on a collective level? Um, this would be theory because the only thing that on the collective level that I've experienced as something at one is, is that we sing together because then I can feel a frequency. So then I can say something about it. In this case, what I'm describing now, 
of an experience that feels very good, um, a joint meditation with a bigger group can be very uh, deep and uh, a wonderful collective experience. More from the books, as you may know too, there are many experiments done where big groups, especially in India, meditate on the health and well-being. For example, tests have been done on Hospital A somewhere in California that is then uh, monitored and uh, compared to a hospital where the focus is not on. And then you see quite some differences. Even with dropping of crime rates, um, tests have been done in big cities on the East Coast, way back, I think, in the 80s or 90s, that showed the same results. In other words, a mindset, even um, without speaking the words, even without taking uh, action other than doing the meditation on, in a focused way, can have tremendous wonderful effects. And look at the effect that the child has that doesn't speak the words. That we look with two people or three people around the baby bed and we look in the eyes of the child and we come in the vibration of the eyes of the child. And we enjoy it and we basically share the same wonderful, loving, vibration you say that our minds aim to serve our heart can you explain that yeah I'll try um, we have two ways and perhaps more to which information that's what expresses itself in form Basically, that's all what happens within us as well as around us can be experienced and shared. Uh, we as human beings are one of the billions of expressions of life. We have these two faculties, the faculties, the mental faculty, uh, in which we are trained in all kinds of schools to trust the mental faculty the mental faculty expresses itself in words and numbers. With numbers and words, we can make comparisons. And so it is that we can communicate with one another in comparisons. Um, and that's what we call the rational mind. And we're very good, especially in the West, to use that in order to process information. But on the side, this is what I just mentioned, the male side, we have the sister, the female side, which is the feeling capacity. We all know that we can feel. And the big difference between the mental faculty is that when it expresses itself, the experience is already over. While the feeling faculty experiences directly and gives us instantaneously information about an inner, outer, or combo of it situation. The tragedy is that we are not trained to, to trust that. We are not learned, we're not taught in schools to trust our feelings. As a child, an animal, any metabolizing system in the universe doesn't use a mind, hardly, none, I would say none. And it responds or reacts to feelings. Feelings for people, for mankind, is a little bit tricky. Because with feelings, I mean, in essence, pure feeling. And a pure feeling for me is like you play the violin and through the strings, on the body of the violin, a sound is produced that resonates with our ear, and it goes through the body without any opinion. The, 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 the string 
nor the body of the violin has an opinion, has no judgment. Now here it comes. Sometimes the violin can play its fault, and that's what I call an emotion. An emotion is the clutter on the feeling. The feeling itself, when it's completely pure, it connects us with the whole and all. But any form of clutter is related to a form of ego, a form of opinion, not a discernment, and has somewhere an interest. Not that it's bad to have a feeling, because if we, with love, give attention with our awareness to that clutter, it melts. And we can feel again. We do not feel an emotion again, but we feel our feelings. I hope I can be a little bit clear in this field. So the uh, most important thing is I would ask everybody to pay seriously pay attention to the importance of your feelings as a trustworthy way to allow yourself to be informed. Let so me ask you this, ratio, Fred. Would, would you ratio, no, no, I, I'm still in your question. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Because I have to knit it together. So the ratio is there to serve the feeling, the feeling of that, not so much the emotion, but the feeling. So, and the heart is the connector with the whole and all. And if it's in the ideal situation, there is no clutter in, on the heart because the heart wants the interest of the universe, which is shining through all of us and through all the elements, metabolizing or not. Sorry that I didn't allow you. <laughs> oh, no, no worries. So what I'm gathering is you're saying that the essence of feeling, feeling at its essence would equal bliss. Any distortions yeah. on top of that, which you we would we should call, we could recognize as emotions, something that is other than the essence of oneness, which always produces and delivers bliss. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. It's very simplified. That's it. You do. You do express it much better than I do, and and, and brief, more brief. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by? And I understand the question. So often we are our own misunderstanding. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a little joke. <laughs> well, um, yeah, <laughs> including me, many people talk, and they have no idea why they talk, and they repeat things not even checking if they are still right if, or if somebody else is listening or um, if it's really checked with the heart. So we are all accustomed to hearing so much talk from, from, from the mind and which is not filtered through the heart. And then I say, we are our own misunderstanding and that has a deeper sense because understanding that word meant in essence we stand under which means those that developed language or created language were in my way of looking at it were very aware that we there was something that reigns us that is in charge of us or through us that doesn't have a name doesn't have a place doesn't know time and then i think and that's why at one time what intuitively came up we are often including me our own misunderstanding under we stand under we stand on the earth but under something else Sounds to me you're speaking about empty talking, talking for the sake of talking, just to talk. Yeah, I, got, I just want to talk. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know, I, I often say this, that very same thing. <clears throat> and I use it, the, the analogy or the description in this way. You have a nine to five job. You work in a cubicle all week. You're going to go hang out with your friends and have some cocktails in a bar or a lounge somewhere. I get it. It's time to talk. You want to just, <laughs> you've just been in a cubicle yeah. all week. But to me, talking is just an opinion. It's just sharing thought because it carries no weight of validity of anything that is deeper 
Sometimes for me, Fred, I love, I love, allow, accept, and appreciate all people. But sometimes when I'm in the presence of people who just want to talk for the sake of talking, I have to leave. It really grates on my energy. Um, you know, often when I say people find it difficult when they're in confront confronted with a situation, if you want to speak from the heart, simply just place your hand here. And it, the awareness of placing your hand here, there are no wrong words. It'll come out so much softer with so much more power. Um, in the essay of self-expression, you tell a story about Mary that feels very relevant to the situation. Can you share a little more about that and the situation of families and so forth? Yeah. Thank you for asking because it was a story that I once read um, by a father that helped his son who was diagnosed autistic to, um, to, to become a fantastic uh, human being by just sharing with him his life. For many months, he sat down on the floor. This is not in the book, by the way. And he tried to connect with his son of four. And at a certain time, the father put on the floor a saucer where you put so in soup. So saucer. Is it a saucer? Saucer, eh? Uh, a plate, a plate, a plate, a plate. You know a plate? And you can put a plate and then you can let it sing. Boom. And then it falls down. And after many months, his son imitated him. And from then on, there was a connection. And it, uh, that's not your question, but that's the guy who tells the following story. Imagine there's Mary. She is four years old and it's Sunday morning, beautiful day somewhere in the United States. And the curtains are open in her bedroom. Her mom and dad have just added wonderful light wallpaper in her room and Mary steps out of her bed and she's fully awake and she says she sees all kinds of crayons lying on the ground and she starts to design on the wall uh, all kinds of wonderful color combos blah 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 and Mary is just having fun and she is one with her expression she is in creation she loves it. And then after a certain time, she hears footsteps on the hallway. And a little later, the flush of the toilet. The door opens a few seconds later. Mom comes in. Mom, three times taller than Mary, having not so long ago best fed Mary, giving her all the security, shouts at Mary and says, Mary! What have you done? We just made this wall, wall, beautiful wallpaper on your on your walls and you're just destroying it. You're never, never going to do it again. Back into your bed, she slams the door. End of this part of the story. Mary, not a stupid girl, grows up. She listens very politely to her mom, to her dad to her teaching kindergarten in school, to the professor in university. And Mary is one of the most brilliant researchers in the world without any feelings, because they were at her year four aborted. She has frozen her feelings and she is successful in that way, but she is handicapped. And in a way, when I heard that story 30 years ago, it reminded me of myself. Mom had an option at the time. Mom could have opened the door, could have said, hey, Mary, what's happening here? How wonderful, you're creating a painting. It is beautiful, wow, and that, what does that mean? Anyway, but let me, you know, <laughs> it was not the idea of the wallpaper. Uh, let's go to the store tomorrow and we buy you a nice sketchbook and next time you do it there. And by the way, Keith, that reminds me, I'm, I'm befriended with Jane Goodall. I do not know if you know of her. 
she's the shimp lady. Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. And she stayed many times with me and I with her. I traveled with her. And in and she told the story, and it's in many of her books, that uh, also around that age, she sneaks out of the house, the Birches in Bournemouth, uh, where she had a, where she still is, by the way. <laughs> And she goes into how you call the den of the chicken. She goes in the in the chicken house because she was so curious to see where those eggs come from. She had no idea. <laughs> so she sat there in the corner of the chicken house, waiting to really see it. But what she did not know was that her mom could not find her. She was there, and mom was in the house and was very yeah concerned. Where is Jane? You know, my mom, four years old, go away. So finally, she finds her in the hen house. And, and she had the response of uh, the second version of the Mary story. She was very allowing, said how lovely. And she, through her lifetime, she has very much given her support to explore and explore. Even went with her on the, one of the first trips to Tanzania. The story you told a minute ago is so my upbringing from South Louisiana, lots of Catholics. Yeah. You break something, you get it. Don't touch that on the table. It belonged to your great grandmother. So at an early age, the word no is so powerful and corrosive to a child. The ego becomes even more born, more instilled because in the know of things, it creates this rift, this rend, this tear, this separation that that on the table doesn't belong to me versus it actually belongs to all of us. <laughs> but it's, it creates a division within the child's mind and the reprimand, it will always stay there. It, it sounds mm -hmm. like my, the story of my yeah. upbringing and many people. And many people, yeah. It's interesting, Keith. I do quite some uh, uh, shows now and podcasts, and I think out of ten, seven times this question comes up. Well, for people that have read the book, seven out of ten, it's a lot. So there's a lot of pain here, eh? And yeah. Basically, you see it's you see it play out at Amazon and Google at uh, wherever, wherever. The whole idea is when you are top performer with your ratio, with your mental faculty, you are awarded a lot of applause, but the inner child, the child that's feeling is crying, but it's overshouted by the mind. The inner parent? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Would you say we need to get out in nature more? Oh, definitely. Right. To nurture our inner nature. Ooh, that's delicious. Mm, nature is <laughs> nature, in, 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 out. We need to yeah. get back to supernature, the supernatural. You know, nature's nature, but God is beyond what we even call nature. And that's pretty freaking super, yeah. <laughs> supernatural. And that's where we will find those glimpses or those intervals that we need to learn to get better at, to feel that ongoing bliss in shorter intervals, you know, ride the, the cosmic wave, the stream that's just moving in all of us. And what keeps us often from that is the monkey in the mind and those yeah. emotions. Yeah, because the monkey wants what he wants and he will never shut up. And so what we do is we give the monkey what he wants, what he really wants, a banana. So we give him a spiritual <laughs> banana. We give him something to pacify his time. So when he has banana in his mouth, he can't speak. <laughs> so we, we can hear we can hear the essence of spirit saying you know take a right at the street don't ask why just take a right and then over a period of time you learn to trust this inner guiding system that always has your not only your best entrance in, interest in in mind it is your heart it's trying to lead us back to that gate and I love the fact that you had experience slash experiences in your life that remind you of your essence and your eternity that's phenomenal I love seeing someone who reminds me of the, the work that I've done. You know, it's a path. It can be a slippery slope. Well, you have to learn how to slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think we should get back to nature, yeah?
back to sorry. Back to our nature. Yeah, yeah. This most natural thing to do. Indeed, Tell us about your movie, sir. Go ahead, go ahead, please continue. Right. No, I mean, with nature, um, we cannot stretch our heartbeat. That all can happen within a certain zone. We cannot stretch our um, breathing. Yeah, it can go up and down, but it has certain margins within we can move. But there, beyond it, we die. What is it with the mind that we keep on going in higher and higher frequencies, that we are bombarded with more and more information that we hardly can deal with? And why is there not a kind of inner controlling system apart from sleep that helps us to still our minds? That's an interesting question. I do not have the answer. That's something we have under control. And to a certain extent, of course, heartbeat and breathing. But the range in the mind is so big. While, of course, the uh, movement of the from frequency to frequency is important. But we are, most of us are all the time in overdrive without any correction. You think? <laughs> yeah. It's definitely yeah, an overdrive. Me. Yeah. And that creates stress. And from stress comes blah, 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 as we know. And, yeah. Everyone, so, Keith Anthony sorry, Blanche, and you're sorry. speaking with my guest today, Mr. Fred Metzer. Um, we've been having some connection issues, but I think everything worked out okay to where we have it on Facebook, which I can also uh, take this remote recording and put this up on YouTube later. So welcome, everyone. Fred, could you tell us, we're slowly, but surely getting to the top of the hour, could you tell us about this wonderful documentary and how this listening audience can find um, access to yeah, wonderful well, film? Yeah, we made that uh, documentary uh, more than a year ago, and it's called uh beyond me documentary dot org in which i describe my life philosophy and more at length with images the uh experiences that i've had and i use the uh, example of the kitchen curtain that i described earlier in this show please have a have a look I'm I'm happy that it has had a wonderful reception, and even at the launch we wanted to do it in the theater. And there was just a moment that COVID started March 15 last year, my birthday, when I turned 75, and we had to cancel. But uh, we then had a a show with uh, 400 guests on Zoom, and. Yeah, anyway, we, I had the most lovely comments, none of them being negative. Anyway, Keith, you have seen it, so you can better comment on him. I recommend it. It's very uh, humanitarian. Uh, this wonderful man, serious about what he does. He's passionate about it, reaching a lot of people, other people reaching back. You know, it's great to, re you know, to be a stepping stone for other people, but sometimes, you know, we, we need to step. <laughs> Because other yep. people have pieces of the beautiful jigsaw puzzle that when it's fully fashioned together, we see this beautiful face shining through. And it looks like nothing that we can even imagine. I think when we try to imagine what the final it of it all could be and or look like, we actually pigeonhole ourselves into more nonsense. Would you say so? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's important. Deepak always say, there are infant, Deepak Chopra says always, we have infinite possibilities. Every time we are seduced to take uh, steps in a street that we already have gone into zillions of times and we don't need to go into it again. Also, and even with me, I have several issues that still bother me that happened in my life and I have not yet forgiven myself or others that, and I still have to work on it, you know, it is, uh, and then I always also think, yeah, there are other roads. Sometimes I can let go and and sometimes it's not possible. Um, but what I can say in this respect, um, the least uh, 
the less stress I have, the more able I can let go of things that bother me. If I'm under stress, or I have not eaten well, or I'm, I'm ill, or then those things keep on popping up. Yes, they do. <laughs> and they don't need your permission. They won't tell you they're about to. They won't call you and say, hey, I'm coming to your house in five minutes to pick yeah, you up. They just simply the show up. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, everyone, I've been posting links to Fred's work in the forum. Please walk all over his page and let him know you exist. Do you have any other books before this book? Or do you have any others you're going to be yeah. working on shortly? I wrote uh, Rediscover Your Heart in 90, 2008, 2009. And way back for the State of the World uh, Forum, I wrote uh, some thoughts on creation back in 1996. Yeah. And, and I'm working on another book of essays. And the Dutch translation is coming. So uh, perhaps other languages as well, like the last one was also in Dutch, Spanish, and German. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah. Wow. You have a final message for us, sir. Yes, I do. Love it. 1986, <laughs> 1983, I listened to audio tapes. Audio tapes of Jerry Jampolsky, Dr. Jerry Jampolsky, and Diane Serencioni. Jerry was a child psychiatrist, a big fan of The Course in Miracles. He became one of my best friends, and he died last December, 94, 95. His saying was, love is letting go of fear. Where there's love, there is no fear. And where there's fear, there is no love. Since I heard that sentence, and that sentence is always with me, I know it's true because there is no fear when there's no, when there's love. And there is uh, the other way around, no love when there's fear. And perhaps at another occasion, I can go more deep in this. It's a very big subject, but I can. We still have a few minutes, actually, if you want, if you want to give us a little more in-depth. Um... Yeah. Um, basically, if we understand that we live in the finite, time and space, that time and space is and has an end. What I described beyond the curtain in those 12 seconds had no beginning nor end. That was infinity. So the infinite can in encompass, inspire and transpire the finite time space of which in flesh we are part of, our planets, our universe. The question came up, by which phenomena does resistance, does story, time, space, the finite exist? By the phenomena of plus and minus polarity, duality. Remember, infinity is un unity, finite is duality. And there's a simple thing, just the phenomena of polarities creates Resistance. Resistance is the building block of fear in psychology. In physics, it's just resistance. So the trick of God with a smile on his face, I say metaphorically, is to bring us in the paradox, to just bring us in flesh, which exists by the grace of resistance, to learn laterally about love. Yeah. So we are encapsulated here, so to say, until the moment that the door goes open and we understand with our, our consciousness opens with consciousness is infinite. That the transcendence at the state is possible. 
which is just the experience of unconditional love. Short version. Heaven on earth. Looks like yep. that. <laughs> yeah. And it's located, we follow the master Christ. You know, he was nailed to two planes. Yeah. Well, why do they intersect? Right there in the Stargate. And he exposed himself, made himself vulnerable. My four models, Fred, uh, for a fantastic life is passion, sincerity, humility, and vulnerability. So we know it as the passion of the Christ. Sincerity, oh, he was serious about it. He was going to do it. <laughs> he was so humbled, and he made himself vulnerable with the outstretched arms, if you will. And through this literal but also metaphorical lesson for humanity, he exposed his core, made himself vulnerable. So that very light from here simply began to flood the world system. Um, I noticed that in, I think in your bio, my apologies, I didn't have it. I'm just dealing with so much technology. You spoke about vulnerability. Before we go and exit for at least this interview, I would love to have you back. Um, can you tell us a little more about that special sacred place of the woman vulnerability? Yeah, basically that goes hand in hand with what I earlier said that um, we see have the, the, the back to the poles plus and minus is giving and receiving is the male principle and the female principle is the physical force and the sisters of power of vulnerability. And without the, vulner the, uh, the acknowledging of the vulnerability, there is not life possible. Life is not possible. Think of the womb, think of the seeds in the ground, think of all that is vulnerable before it manifests. In the darkness, which darkness has a huge function because in the darkness there is the highest potential. And it's the female principle as the guard of this darkness. And when it comes to the light, look at the babies, look at the little flowers. We nourish them, we help them to grow because we love them. The very moment we come to train our minds, express ourselves, in words, but like we did not before, we are going to take a lot of risk as we are seeing finally coming climate change. So I would highly endorse any initiative that helps to restore the functionality of the female principle. The, the male principle shouts and expresses itself Stillness is a female principle. It allows itself to be discovered. And the tragic is that silence can't have an ambassador because it needs to speak. Thank you, sir, for joining me here on Center of Light Radio. Thank you so much. Miles of smiles to everybody. Have a wonderful day. From wow. Greetings from Holland, from the Netherlands. <laughs> Everyone, Keith Anthony Blanchard with Fred Mazer. What's that, sir? Uh, I said, stay in touch with the Dutch. <laughs> you got any more? You got another one? Uh, oh, well, sprinkles of twinkles. <laughs> Lots of balls. Everyone, Keith Anthony Blanchard here, Center of Light Radio. Fred said something just a bit ago. Remind me, and I'm, I'm a paraphrase, of course, by Master Osho, uh, The Innocence. Being a child, being a small sapling or a small sprout, we should nurture that. He says, you know, a flower grows for you to admire, and in such admiration, it will grow into a greater, more beautiful thing to admire. Once you pluck it, it begins to die. And that's sort of what the mind wants. The mind wants to pull things out. It wants to possess and own them versus just simply looking at them as beautiful as they are in its infinite, infinite potential that lies within. It's always about infinite potential. You're not anything else. That's all you are is infinite potential. And when we understand that and we turn that potential within itself, it be, creates a feedback loop. And just like music, when someone doesn't know what they're doing with the sound system, put the microphone too close to the speaker, it begins a regeneration process. That's why you hear that horrible noise. Well, likewise, but in a different way, when you turn within yourself 
and shine the light of awareness on that potential, it becomes infinite potential. And he creates a feedback, a biofeedback loop that resonates throughout your entire being. Then it creates another way of seeing. And then everything you have been wanting simply becomes free and becomes yours. It's, your, it's yours by birthright, not by possession. Keith Anthony Blanche, the Center of Light Radio. Thank you all for hanging tough with me through this technology. Um, again, I want to say thank you to Fred. Please go check out his website. All the links are in these forums. And I will be seeing you soon. And always remember, you are loved beyond measure. It is my pleasure. I'll see you soon. Yeah.